People called him Johnny. He lived in a state not too far away. Johnny had been a missionary. At an earlier time, he had been the minister for the congregation where I was serving. When I knew Johnny, he preached part-time for a small congregation in another town. His full-time job was butcher at the grocery store he owned. I didn't preach very many funerals while working with that congregation because Johnny was asked to preach most of them. He would always ask me to lead the prayer for the funeral meal. He had to get back to the meat counter so he didn't have time for the meal. Johnny was a hometown boy. He wasn't the best preacher I ever heard, but the local congregation and many in the community had seen Johnny grow from a rough beginning to the man he became. His hometown loved, respected, and appreciated him. Mark tells of an incident in the ministry of Jesus with a much different outcome. Jesus visited his hometown. As Earl McMillan observed, Jesus' summary of this incident, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, recognizes a long-standing characteristic of human nature. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. As we look at our text, we first see the reaction of Nazareth to Jesus, verses 1 through 3. Now the first five chapters of Mark are replete with huge crowds that flock to see and hear Jesus. However, from the very beginning, there are those who oppose him. Tommy South says, chapter six begins with a geographical reference, leaving Capernaum and going to Nazareth. And the theme of unbelief continues to dominate the narrative. In spite of the overwhelmingly positive impression which Jesus was making, most continued to disbelieve and even the apostles did not manifest the faith they should have. Still, Jesus continues his ministry of compassion toward those in need. Someone said while chapter 5 was about faith, chapter 6 might be called the skeptic's chapter. Mark tells us that Jesus went to his hometown, literally to his own country. And we know from Matthew's gospel that this was the little town of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is not mentioned, was not mentioned in the Old Testament or in historical writings. Skeptical scholars in the 19th century questioned its existence. The discovery of an ancient inscription mentioning Nazareth, as well as an archaeological excavation, had put those doubts to rest. Matthew and Luke referred to Nazareth as a city, but it was never more than a small village of perhaps a few hundred persons. <laughs> Now, the town was hardly remote. The Greek-styled city of Sephoris was just a few miles away, and not much further was one of the most ancient Roman trade routes leading from Egypt to Damascus. Nazareth apparently did have the reputation of being an insignificant backwater place. In John chapter 1, verse 46, upon hearing that Jesus was from Nazareth, Nathaniel asked, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Well, Jesus goes from Capernaum to his hometown of Nazareth, and as was his custom on the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue. Jesus apparently made synagogue just about every Sabbath, and he was often invited to speak as a guest. 
Jesus' home turf would seem to have a good potential for success, except that we know his family has already tried to collar him and bring him back home because they were afraid or convinced he was unbalanced, if not insane. David Garland said, Jesus is in his old stomping ground, and his townsfolk believe they know all there is to know about him and his family background. They are amazed when they hear Jesus. Well, you would think that was a good thing. But immediately they follow that up with some questions, some questions that discredit Jesus. William Lane says, what was the source of his wisdom? And who had empowered him to speak and act with such authority? To these questions, two answers lie close at hand. The source was God, or it was demonic. Jesus had already been accused of doing his work by the power of Satan. Those in his hometown were saying, okay, we know this Jesus. He grew up here. We saw him grow up. They knew that he was not the graduate of any rabbinical school. They knew that his own relatives at that point in time refused to believe in him. They says, is not this the carpenter? As was no doubt the case, Jesus growing up in the family of Joseph, being the oldest especially, learned his father's trade. Now the word that is translated carpenter, in our, carpenter in our Bibles uh, could be a woodworker. It was a skilled person. But they said, is he not a common worker with his hands, even as the rest of us are? A side note, Jesus is described as being a carpenter. John P. Meyer said, the airy weakling often presented to us in pious paintings and Hollywood movies would hardly have survived the rigors of being Nazareth's tecton, that is carpenter, from his youth to his early 30s. Jesus, no doubt, had the hands of a carpenter or woodworker. He had the muscles. He was an outdoorsman, far different than many of the paintings we've seen. But the basic question that his hometown folks were asking is, well, who is he? Who does he think he is? They also said, isn't this the son of Mary? And here we are on Mother's Day. And as us we fathers know Mother's Day gets a whole lot more attention than Father's Day. <clears throat> and we're okay with that. I'm even wearing a tie that my mother gave me years ago in honor and remembrance of her. But things were different centuries ago and different in the Jewish society. The Jews did not normally describe a man as the son of his mother, even when she was a widow except in insulting terms. Well, why do his hometown people say, is not this the son of Mary? Well, the thought might be, well, Joseph, by this point, may have died. He's out of the picture. But again, as we've just quoted, that wasn't very likely. This may very well have been a statement of contempt. Nazareth was a small town. Small towns are really good at gossip. And when Mary was told that she was going to have a son, she said, how can this be? <coughs> she knew she was a virgin. She and Joseph were engaged. And the Bible tells us that they did not have relations until after Jesus was born. When you think about the timing of things, probably there were some folks in his town who questioned his legitimacy. All they knew was that he lived in Joseph's house, but there was something about the chronology, the timeline. And so this may have indeed been a disparaging remark. They said, aren't his brothers here with us? James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And we also find out that Jesus had sisters. They're not named anywhere, but he had sisters. He came from a large family. And I suppose we need to do a little side note here. It doesn't cost you any extra. There is a major religious group that says that Mary was a perpetual virgin. This is a doctrine developed long ago, widely held by a lot of people, 
especially in one church. It is an unbiblical doctrine. The most likely scenario is that after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary had children. Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters. Well, the folks in town may be amazed, but they're apparently not impressed. They question Jesus' qualifications. They question his background, even his parentage, perhaps. Christopher Marshall said, Their unbelief lies not in a failure to perceive the quality of Jesus' words or the reality of his miracles. It lies rather in a refusal to admit the true source of his wisdom and power and to accept the unique identity of the one who manifests them. For Jesus to be saying what he was saying, for him to be doing what he was doing, the miracles, he had to have power from God. And those who knew him growing up just weren't seeing that. But the glory of Jesus did not lie in his family background. It didn't rely on the reputation of his hometown. It relied on his relationship to his father, and his father was God. He was the Son of God. Well, that's the reaction of Nazareth to Jesus, but then we're told of the reaction of Jesus to Nazareth, verses 4 through 6. Jesus said to them, to those who had just criticized him, detracted from him, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. This was probably a familiar proverb or saying of sorts. There are records of various forms of this in ancient times. But Jesus' statement provides an explanation for the people's unbelief, but it does not provide an excuse. Martel Pace said those who had known Jesus when he was a child could not explain him, so they rejected him. They were offended at the hometown boy who seemed to be claiming too much for himself. No man can have more demeaning critics than those who have known him from his boyhood. Now sometimes the local town will be proud of what one of their youth became. But sometimes when he gets up there and he's doing great things, they say, well, we remember when he was getting in trouble at school. We remember when he was doing this, that, and the other, and they put him down. Philip Brooks said, familiarity breeds contempt, but only with contemptible people or things. The contempt for Jesus reveals far more about those in Nazareth than it does about Jesus. They were the ones with the problem. Charles Erdman said, the chief reason why a prophet is without honor is that he is really unknown. Jesus was not rejected at Nazareth because he was so well known, but because men thought they knew him while actually they were the most ignorant of his real, most ignorant of his real person and mission. Now the lack of belief was known to Jesus, so he would not be inclined to do more miracles when those he'd done should have been sufficient to produce faith. We're told by Mark that he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few people. Now the power of Jesus was not limited. He had all power. We need to remember already in the Gospel of Mark that the miracles of Jesus often drew serious rebukes from the people where they were performed. Yes, miracles could produce faith, but there were many who saw the miracles and still disbelieved, and that was the case here in Nazareth. And so Mark Black says, rather than amazing the citizens of Nazareth with his many miracles, Jesus was himself amazed at their unbelief. Once again, Mark stresses the importance of belief. The idea is not that Jesus was powerless apart from faith, even though verse 6 mentions unbelief. 
Rather, it would have been foolish for Jesus to demonstrate his power in open defiance of the rejection of the people. Such action would have tended to harden them in their unwillingness to accept him. Well, Jesus went to his hometown a few times, as we see in the different accounts in the gospel. <clears throat> but it seems likely that at one point, after the rejection, that he never went back. Not that we know of. As the son of a preacher, years ago especially, I thought how neat it would be to go back to one of my hometowns. I had several being a preacher's kid. I thought of how neat it would be to go back and be the minister there. Well, as the years have gone on, I realize that those who were the grown-ups when I was there, many of them have died. There's definitely odor. It's the kids that I grew up with who've gotten old. I don't know what happened to them. I'm still young. <clears throat> but the reality is, you know, you really can't go back to your hometown for the most part. Debbie and I enjoyed visiting with my childhood friends, Connie and Charlton, on Friday. And they were asking, well, have you been back to, have you been back to? And they had stopped by in those towns. Well, we were in those towns, my hometowns, a few years back, and they had really changed. Well, Jesus was from a hometown, and sadly, the folks in his hometown rejected him. They were amazed, but that amazement was coupled with rejection. And in response, Jesus was amazed at their attitude. Jesus and his countrymen are dumbfounded by each other. The hometown folks were amazed, and so was Jesus. Jesus.